Let's uh, turn to a clip uh, that features Alan Ruck, the actor. He has sure. been around for a long time. Uh, you know, we loved him in Ferris Bueller. We saw him most recently in Succession. And he has something to say about the studio, the suits, the heads, technology, capitalism. Uh, let's run this clip. It used to be kings and queens and emperors, and now it's captains of industry. And they think that the world and everything on it and in it, everything in the air and in the ocean belongs to them. And they think that human beings who are not of their you know, socioeconomic class are just another natural resource, mostly to be managed, to be utilized, maybe exploited, but mostly to be managed. Because they always say stuff like, those people, they're asking for too much. Well, we're not. We're not asking for too much. We're asking for what's fair. This isn't, this isn't about the movie stars. This is about the journeyman actors, the journeyman writers, the people that, that make the thing go. The wet dream for uh, some big shots is like, just hire one star and have the AI do everything else, you know? Well, we're not going to allow that. I mean, we're not going to allow it. I mean, yeah, I mean, if it, if it could happen, It'll happen, right? If it can happen, that's exactly what will happen. But the solution to, I mean, you, this will not surprise you, Nick, but I think the solution to this is more capitalism. Right. That the problem we have, and I actually feel like we, things go in cycles, right? So you had a deregulation cycle that kind of encouraged these behemoth studios and networks to join. And, you know, we have a, you know, uh, Comcast is a giant cable network and a studio and a TV network and a streaming service. I think now it that, may own uh, parts of the Pentagon as well at this point. It, 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 I hope not because it is an incompetent conglomerate and should not exist. And it definitely is a sign of <laughs> Okay, right, 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 right. I mean, it should not exist and it will be busted up. And capitalism is what's going to bust these things up. And when they're bust, and I don't think, I mean, in the old days, it was fed, the federal regulators. You know, Richard Nixon said, I don't like these TV networks. They hate me. So I'm going to make sure they can't own the TV shows they put on because if they could do that, then they are really, really rich. Um, now, what have he, had he just let them do it, they would have gotten really, really rich for like a day and then really, really poor for like a year, which is what's about to happen to all these big companies, which is why they're even now today talking about what pieces of their, of their business they're going to sell. Right. Um, and when they sell them all, uh, everything in show business will be better for the next 15 years until they you know, put them all back together again, as they do. Would you could you describe briefly? And we have a clip of uh, that we'll, we'll show after this. But, Rob, what is the experience of anti-capitalism in Hollywood? Uh, because on the one hand, you know, rhetorically, a lot of movie stars, a lot of writers, a lot of producers, a lot of studio heads are anti-capitalists even as they are phenomenally successful business people and you know good at marketing and self branding and all of that stuff but what it, what is it like as being somebody who is you know on the right politically uh, i think you call yourself a conservative or uh, uh, maybe a conservatarian libertarian conservative whatever but like you <laughs> like outcast. markets yeah right. you you like, like markets, markets yeah. you like freedom you like be, people being able to kind of innovate and things like that what's what's the you know, the felt experience of anti-capitalism for you in Hollywood? Well, I mean, I don't know. It's the, it's the, uh, it's kind of the same reason that people don't like capitalism in general. It's they don't like the uncertainty of it. Mm -hmm. That the question you have to ask yourself with capitalism is what I'd rather go for the uncertainty here, change, disruption, all sorts of things, you know, rational act, economic acting, or would I rather cling to something that I know and is, um, safe and if you're at the very top of any organization you you prefer to cling to something that's safe capitalism the way you and i understand it i think <laughs> is dangerous right we right. really had capitalism we wouldn't have uh, goldman sachs or we wouldn't have jp morgan chase or we wouldn't have these giant uh, regulatory ca capture scenarios across the board mm -hmm. um so if you're a movie star and you kind of think well i mean i know you have giant ego and you think you're a genius but there's a, always a voice inside your head that says wait a minute I know that I'm lucky because I almost didn't go to that audition or I didn't really want to be in that project that made me the big, whatever it is, right? So you're not really crazy about rational economic chaos, creative destruction. You, right. You'd like the idea of there being some kind of somebody, some, some people in charge. And you can hear that in the, in the, in the arguments made by, you know, Brian Cranston and Alan Ruck, the idea that there are these malevolent 
evil geniuses who have a plan. They're twirling their mustache up there with the yeah. League of Supervillains. And if we let them let them have their plan, they're going to succeed, right? But yeah. the truth is that they, and that may have been true in 2007, I think, but those same actors, that, by the way, they are pretty much, in many cases, the same actors. Yeah. Um, I mean, in the, the corporate actors, um, have utterly failed. Let's look at one of those uh, actors who has utterly failed, and this is Robert Iger, Mr. Iger. Um, I love the false decorum, by the way, when people on strike are like Mr. Iger, yeah. you know, uh, et cetera. But uh, let's run the clip of Robert Iger because we've been talking about this from, you know, kind of, okay, the actors and writers are kind of, you know, or I'll, I'll say I find them a little bit annoying. Mm -hmm. Uh, but, you know, the studio heads are equally obnoxious and And by the way, Bob Iger is who, that is who Cranston and uh, yes. Ruck are yeah. both Ruck. pretty much talking Spe directly specifically about. Specifically talking about. Yeah. Yes. So let's, here's Robert Iger, uh, beleaguered chairman of Disney. We're in the midst of a writer's strike and very likely it would seem to have a actor's strike. How is that going to impact things and what are your expectations there? Well, I think it's very disturbing to me. I, you know, we've talked about uh, disruptive forces on this business and all the challenges that we're facing and the recovery from COVID, which is ongoing. It's not completely back. This is the worst time in the world to add to that disruption. There's a level of expectation that they have that is just not realistic. And they are adding to a set of challenges that this business is already facing that is quite frankly very disruptive. So they're not being realistic? Dangerous. No, they're not. I respect their right and their desire to get as much as they possibly can in compensation for their people. I, you know, I completely respect that. I've been around long enough to understand that dynamic and to appreciate it. But you also have to be realistic about the business environment and what this business can deliver. It is and has been a great business for all of these people and it will continue to be even through disruptive times. I, I wish they had pulled back so we could see that he is standing on like little children. Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, who, a mound uh, of skulls. <laughs> yeah. But how, um, so, you know, Iger uh, and Zach, you had the number. We'll, we'll show it in a bit. But how much yeah. did Disney lose uh, in 2022? It was, uh, it was yeah. 100 million. Uh, 401 million dollars. Um, so he, uh, you know, his, his, and he came back to Disney. So he's, you know, he's kind of on the hot seat, but Rob, what do you, what do you, how do you respond to something like that? Well, look, you know, the, the irony here is that he is the smartest guy in show business, really. Mm -hmm. I mean, he's a very smart guy. Um, and his, uh, company is just too giant and he started Disney plus and he shouldn't have, um, mm -hmm. He did a lot, a lot of dumb things, and he's right that, that if you believe that, if you've done this terrible job running these big media companies, and you're looking at your you know quarterly earnings or your, your annual earnings, you're looking at the future and the future competition, and how much it's going to cost you to keep feeding your machine for content for eleven dollars a month, and you don't have any pricing power. They don't have any pricing power. These people, mm -hmm. um, they're in a business they've never been in before consumer product business. That's what a subscription service is. They don't make consumer products. They make TV shows, right? They're not making Fritos. They're making TV shows. Um, so they have no, there's no experience in this business and the business is kicking their ass. Mm -hmm. um, but if you insist that that's the business you're in, yes, of course, it's incredibly meddlesome and troublesome and disruptive and unrealistic for the writers and the actors to ask you to do something else. Because you're like, hey, listen, it's like, you know, we've driven the car into a ditch. Mm -hmm. stop you know I, I don't have time to like get you a cheeseburger or whatever it is right but the driving it into the ditch was the problem the problem isn't now that you know you guys aren't on our side they they, they haven't offered any you know notice these they never offer you like shares in the company you know they, <laughs> they don't do that they're not they're not really at, are offering to make you a stakeholder in the business so you know he's smart but I, 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 there is no solution for these people, even if, even if the, somehow they, it turns out that the studios strike a deal that they believe they can then sell to the shareholders is like a good deal. There is no future for these companies except to be to, to break themselves up, and they yeah. will.
It sounds, you know, while you were talking, it reminds me a bit of the uh, airline industry, which goes through these cycles of booms and busts and where right. uh, smaller airlines buy each other and they become bigger because they're going to have economies of scale and market share. And then they can dictate, you know, they have pricing power and it never quite works out that way. And then occasionally you'll get like years ago, United, the employees are like, OK, well, you know, we're going to buy it because that way we'll own the company we're a part of. And the minute they did that, they were like, we don't know how to run an airline. We don't want to. And they tried to sell it back, et cetera. So maybe we're going through one of these cycles. Zach, let's talk. Um, you have some slides about just like looking at the big picture of, uh, you know, what, you know, how's it, how's it working out for studios that kind of support a lot of what Rob is talking about here? Yeah. So we mentioned Disney posting a negative $401 million uh, loss in 2022. Netflix, uh, you'll see here, you know, Netflix, Sony, both uh, down uh, profit wise. Warner Brothers, NBC, Universal, Paramount posted modest increase in their profit margins for 2022. Uh, the Writers Guild provided this uh, historical graphic, uh, which you mm -hmm. see, you know, billions, uh, tens of billions in operating profits for the, the big companies over the years, although they also concede that 2022 in particular was a rough year uh, for the industry. Um, this just shows the uh, executive pay for all the big studio chiefs um, and, you know, in, in the hundreds, tens to hundreds of millions for s some of them, uh, most uh, many of them uh, did take a pay cut in 2022. Whoa. So, you know, yeah. still living, still Look at living that. large. Ari of Emmanuel only at about 20 million. Uh, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, you know, Ari built a business. Ari yeah. yeah, built well, a business. Rob, can we go back to that real quick? Yeah. Though? Can, you know, Rob, one of the things that you hear again and again, uh, you know, from, you know, say the Alan Rucks of the world is that it is obscene. Ari Emanuel, who is part of a leading, you know, he's the brother of Rahm Emanuel. He's a liberal Democrat, if not a progressive Democrat. He has made, uh, you know, in the past five years, he's made three hundred and forty six million dollars. And Alan Ruck says that is obscene. That is wrong. He doesn't deserve to make that much money. Is Alan <laughs> Ruck? Is Alan Ruck right? No, he's wrong. Ari Emanuel built a business. It's his business. He built it. He's not mm. like it's a everybody who pay. It's a by the way. It's a business built on fees, right? You know, the business itself was a talent agency. He's got a lot of other pieces of mm. pieces to it now, but it started as a talent agency. People willingly enge engaged in a contract with Ari Emanuel because he was a passionate and great talent, man talent agent representative, mm -hmm. and they gave him a portion of their earnings, and he worked for them. He built that business. St. Patrick Weitzel's on the bottom of that. Patrick's another partner at WME, and he, he did that. It's mm -hmm. like, no, of course he deserves it. That That's not, I mean, and lumping him in with some of the sort of factotums there, is, it doesn't seem fair. Uh, I would mm -hmm. say, and I, and I say that as somebody who's not represented by Ari at all, but but I he built a business, he deserves it. He he earned that money. I'm not. I don't. I don't. I, I, it, 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 the, when it, when the argument becomes about uh, people getting rich, and they shouldn't be getting rich, you know that the they've lost the thread of the argument. The argument really should be, um, you're not going to pull this business out of a ditch by giving me a pay cut, mm -hmm. and by removing. Uh, uh, income streams from me. You're going to still have to live up to the standards of paying me for my, either my residuals in my image or my residuals in my writing, and you're going to have to figure out another way to pull your company out of the ditch. And the way to do that, as I keep saying over and over again, is just simply make it smaller. Like you find somebody to buy this. If every single one of those companies you had up there broke itself into pieces of exhibiting and studio, um, like a content creator and then a contract mm -hmm. content exploiter. It would be mm -hmm. like the golden years again. And everyone, wow. and the idea, the fear there is that, okay, well, nobody will sell me. They'll no, no studio will sell me their content. Right. That was the net big Netflix fear, which is just completely ludicrous. That just, there's just no evidence for that at all. And there's so much counter evidence to it. Netflix's yeah. own ratings are that like, and, and creating a, a, a lucrative backend, which is what we're talking about for, uh, for content 
is something that's in the is benefits the whole environment. Everyone does better. Do you think that's uh, are you optimistic that is a likely outcome here for the future of the industry? Because, I mean, one interesting aspect of this go around with the actors is that SAG-AFTRA has already issued some waivers to some of the smaller independent yeah. production companies. Is that kind of how it starts to break apart that there, that really these smaller maybe more nimble players are going to be able to move forward while the big ones are kind of stuck in the mud. I think it breaks apart because the shareholders mm. eventually wake up. I mean, uh, the entertainment business is a very great, very, very good place to go and for individuals to get extremely rich. It is not a good place for shareholders to get rich. Mm. Shareholders need to learn that lesson about every 15, 20 years, but they do learn it. And there'll be some activist shareholders, some whoever the latest asshole is that's in some giant hedge fund who's going to like. Oh, yeah, you're speaking of uh, Catholic nuns, right? Yeah, probably right. The right. same ones yeah. who go to Exxon yeah. Mobil meetings show yeah, up. Right. No, it'll know, be some hedge Disney fund guy yeah. who's going to make trouble for Sherry Redstone or make trouble mm -hmm. for somebody and say, "Why do you own this stuff? You're failing at it. You're yeah. failing at your streaming service. You're failing at your studio. Sell it." Is so, there any is there any indication that somebody like Reed Hastings at Netflix is kind of getting that message or the or the leaders at Amazon where, you know, there it becomes even more unclear. You know, uh, I've read that over half of American households are, are Amazon Prime households. That throws yeah. off a lot of money. Prime video is one of the ways that you keep people people right. being prime households. So maybe they don't really care how many people are watching or, you know, and they have yeah, a lot I of mean, cash on hand. But that's a problem. Is, Apple and Amazon don't bit. care, right? Yeah. Yeah. yeah just yeah, to pull show that the data Netflix. on Netflix here. This is the subscriber base for Netflix from 2013 to present. Uh, we're, you know, closing in on 250 million paid subscribers worldwide. So yeah, you do have to think like, even if uh, th th things they're struggling right now, that's that's a lot of people. Uh, there, there's got to be a way to figure out how yeah. to turn that around, right? Well, but but not not if you're spending money the way they spend money on content. But the, the, the right. if, if, if for this slide, the the terror on that slide is the first quarter of 2020 of uh, 2022, because that, that is the fun. first quarter that. The subscriber growth, I think I'm. it was definitely first quarter, so maybe I'm looking at the... Yeah, no, you're that, right. That's no. the first quarter that subscriber growth didn't flatten, it didn't slow, it went down. Yeah. And the rule was that this that will never happen. It'll just slow and plateau, they called it. Mm -hmm. And then they discovered that the people who had... People who gave up Netflix, right? They weren't the people you expect to, the people who got it, in December of 2021, because they wanted to watch movies over the holidays, or they got it because they were, you know, in 2020, they were, they were, it was during the pandemic, they were all home. The people who gave up their Netflix membership in the first quarter of 2022 were people who had been subscribers to Netflix for two plus years, which was not supposed to be possible. That the whole model was built on the fact that once you do it, you're not going to check your credit card bill anymore, and you're not even going to know what that is. You're just out ah, the hell, it's whatever it is. But they didn't. That didn't yeah. happen. Which, of course, anybody, anybody at like Procter and Gamble or the Frito Lay Corporation would have said, mm -hmm. you know, that's not going to work, right? That's not how consumers buy shit. Um, but these guys have no met, no, no, no experience in that, so they had no idea. Um, and, and so, I, but my my long, my short answer to your question, Nick, is that no, I, I. I they should. I mean, if you look at all of the Netflix, you know, literature and the stories around Netflix, always that hyper rational kind of. No, icy no they cold. have like data analytics yeah. up to yin yang, and, and for in for employees too. Like you know, yeah. uh, hey, listen, you were employee number three, but you no longer fit into the system. Right. So you like you self fire yourself. You think this is a yeah. kind of a cult, right? A cult of rational actors, right? And yet, the minute they touch show business, they yeah. just turn I can insane. Be on that was an excerpt of our Reason live stream with Rob Long talking about the Writers Guild strike and the SAG after strikes. If you want to watch another excerpt, go here. And if you want to watch the whole thing, go here. And make sure to come back next Thursday at 1 p.m. Eastern time when Reason's live stream will be talking with somebody who's very interesting saying stuff that you definitely want to hear.